we'll, we'll see, see what happens. Um, we've been talking about linear expressions, and we're kind of going to move on from that, although we'll still have plenty of linear stuff written on the white board. The topic today is inequality. And I'd say we're kind of moving on because we're going to learn how to solve some inequalities. But the only inequalities we're going to learn how to solve are linear inequalities. So it's still kind of a sequel to what we've been doing. And I mean, a linear inequality is, well, I guess exactly how it looks can vary, but it's a relationship between two linear terms where one linear term is less than the other, or one linear term is less than or equal to the other, or one linear term is greater than the other, or one linear term is greater than or equal to the other. So four possibilities, but don't worry, we're not going to have to learn four different techniques. All of these inequalities are solved the same way, no matter what symbol you have in between that. And solving linear inequalities is very much similar to solving linear equalities. So we should probably start by making sure we're all on the same page there. Let's say we have 2x plus 7 equals 5x minus 2. We want to know when the two linear expressions are equal. Um, there are, I guess we sort of have our choice of two things we could do as our first step here. Um, somebody decide for me. What would be a, um, an acceptable first step in solving this equality? Yes. I hear subtract 2x, and I like it. So what we ultimately need to do is to get our x's together on one side of the equality and our numbers together on the other side of the equality. And that's why I said we have options. What we've decided to do is take the x's and move them over to the right. So now our x's are all together on the right-hand side. Well, we could just as easily have subtracted 5x. I mean, it would have given us a negative sign, but if we subtracted 5x, we'd have gotten our x's together on the left-hand side. So using either addition or subtraction, we move our x's to one side. It doesn't matter which. And then I mean, we can maybe guess what to do next. If we want our x's together on one side and we want our non-x's together on the other side, then our next step should be what? Add the two sides. 
exactly correct. Thank you. And we finish this out how? By division. Exactly correct. So you notice, I mean, the things we do, we are adding stuff to both sides, we're subtracting stuff from both sides, we're multiplying the same number to both sides, we're dividing the same number to both sides. The sort of all of the standard arithmetic we can do here. And if instead of an equal sign, you have an inequality, it's almost the same. Like if we have this, we're going to bring our x's to one side. We're going to bring our numbers to the other. Um, does anybody remember offhand? Or does anybody know? What's the only difference between solving an equality and an inequality? There's only one thing that's different in the entire process. Okay, that's fine. If, if everyone already knew everything, I'd sort of wonder what I was doing up here. The only thing that's different in the entire process is that if you ever multiply or divide by a negative number, you must change the direct of the inequality. Yeah. And I'll demonstrate this using that example I've just written down, but let's, let's try to understand why this is. Right? Two is less than a seven. There's a true statement. And we can take this inequality and we can multiply both sides by a positive number and it will still be a true statement. Like two times five is less than seven times five this is the true statement that 10 is less than 35. But what happens if instead of positive 5, we multiply by negative 5? Well, then we get the statement that negative 10 is less than negative 35. And if you think of the number line, that is a false statement. Negative 35 is over there to the left of negative 10. Negative 35 is less than negative 10. So when I talk about flipping the direction of the inequality, 
our less than sign becomes a greater than sign, and now I have a true statement. Negative 10 is greater than negative 35. So if you really want to, you can avoid having to use this rule, but... And I mean, the way you avoid having to use this rule is by arranging your subtraction so that the number in front of the x is positive. So here, 6x minus 7 is less than 4x plus 2. We need to get our x's to one side and our numbers to the other. And what I mean when I talk about keeping the number in front of the x positive, well, there are two potential first steps here. I guess there are really four potential first steps. Um, but we can bring the x's to the left, or we can bring the x's to the right. And if we bring our x's to the left, and then bring our numbers to the right, um, I haven't written it down, but is this clear what I'm doing? I added seven to both sides. Then we can divide by positive 2, and division by positive 2 is perfectly all right, and you don't have to flip any inequalities, and you get that x is less than 9 over 2. It's only if we brought our x's to the other side of the inequality that this new rule would come into play. Because we could do that. I mean, there's absolutely nothing stopping us from bringing our x's to the right instead of to the left. And then we could subtract two from both sides. But now to get x by itself, we have to divide by a negative number, by negative two. And our inequality has to fit. And a negative number divided by a negative number is a positive number. So our answers look a little different, but saying that x is less than nine halves and saying that nine halves is greater than x are two different ways of expressing the same piece of information. Um, so any questions? I know I went through that a bit fast. Um, again, if we can solve equalities, we can solve inequalities, the only thing we have to bear in mind is that one fact, that one difference. And I guess because we do have a little time, I mean, even bearing in mind that we're getting fast work, I guess I'll talk a little about interval notation. It's
an application. We just sort of skipped over this in the past. Um, and I do think, I do maintain that getting a correct answer and being able to express that correct answer in a way that your reader will understand is like 99 out of 100 as far as you know what's important. Because I mean, if you tell your reader X is less than nine over two, your reader is going to understand that perfectly. So it's hard to say that it's incorrect or that it really needs to be written differently. I mean, I feel the same way about intercepts. Like some of you have been probably sternly told, well, an intercept is a point, so it needs to have two coordinates. Whereas from my point of view, if you say the y-intercept is at five, the reader knows what that means, so it's okay. But, um, but anyway, interval notation is a way to express statements like x is greater than something, or x is less than something. And interval notation is made up for our purposes, or for the purposes of this section, of open brackets, closed brackets, Infinity and negative infinity symbols. And numbers. You, uh, you put these all together in the right way and you get interval notation. So, for example, let's start here. Suppose we want to say that X is greater than A. Now what we write is this. And I'm going to take this statement and I'm going to break it down a little. Interval notation, which I actually kind of hate because it looks the same as point notation. But interval notation at its heart looks like this. A and B separated by commas and then some permutation of open parentheses and closed brackets. And all of these are, I mean, these are four very similar things that I have written on the board. These are all of the numbers between A and B. I mean, fundamentally, all four of these are saying virtually the same thing. But there's a bit of ambiguity there. Like if I say all of the numbers between five and seven, it might not be obvious whether I'm including five in that, and it might not be obvious whether I'm including seven in that. 
And that's where these closed brackets and open parentheses come in. An open parenthesis means that we're not including the end point. A closed bracket means we are including the end point. Um, this is pretty standard notation in American classrooms and American textbooks. Some non-American mathematicians have slightly different notation, like sometimes we use backwards brackets to mean, but we'll use the, the notation that is standard for this country, which is open parentheses and closed brackets. So, All the numbers between six and eight, but am I including six in this? I'm seeing nods to right, I am including six. What about eight? I'm seeing shake, um, head shake again to a right, it is not included. So Um, when we solve these linear inequalities, though, you know, when we get statements that x is greater than 7, um, and we want to use these intervals, these closed brackets and open parentheses to express this, I mean, the issue is that an interval has a lowest point and a maximum point, right? It has a starting point and a stopping point, as it were. X is greater than seven. Okay, so we want all of the numbers that are greater than seven, but there's no number we can write here. I mean, we don't want the numbers between seven and 10, or seven and 10 million, or seven and 10 billion. We want all the numbers greater than seven. And that's where these infinity symbols come into play. We'll think of the statement that x is greater than seven as meaning that x is between seven and infinity. And we therefore use our interval notation as you see it on the board. So, give people a chance to write stuff down. So trying to sort of intuit a little. But say I have the statement that x is less than or equal to three. How do we imagine I would write that in interval notation? Yes, exactly correct. Thank you. If we want to say that x is less than some number, we'll think of it as being between a negative infinity and that number. Question. 
does it matter which way you write it? Like you go close bracket three, um, comma, negative infinity, open parentheses, or do um, it have to be in that order? It's always that good question. It's always the smaller number than the bigger number. So because we think of negative infinity as the smallest possible thing, it has to come first. Okay. I guess um, one final comment. Um, infinity is not a number, therefore infinity and negative infinity can never be included in an interval. Therefore, you should not be writing this, and you should not be writing that. Because, again, those closed brackets, those square brackets, are saying we want to include this number, and we can't include infinity, we can't include negative infinity, they're not real numbers. So, other than that, um, yesterday nobody had a chance to uh, finish all of the classwork in the class. Today I'm more hopeful that you'll be able to. So,